Well, first, I would like to thank um, the BBRF for this uh, really prestigious award. Um, Pat Goldman Rakesh was a, an amazing scientist and a, a, another role model for me. Um, I'm, I'm a basic scientist. I work on how memories are encoded in the brain, and and really, um, this is what how Pat started out is really trying to understand working memory, uh, the basic science of that. And um, she moved to cognitive disorders and studying schizophrenia because of the disruption of working memory uh, in these diseases. And um, in my career also, I've been drawn um, initially through funding from NARSAT, actually, in, the, in 1999, uh, to start thinking about cognitive disorders such as schizophrenia, autism, um, um, and many other diseases. And um, we've converged at the synapse. So um, as I'll talk about uh, today, uh, about the mechanisms of memory, um, it turns out that uh, a lot of the beautiful genetics that are going on are, are pointing to the synapse, the genes and proteins and synapses as being mutated uh, or associated with these diseases. So um, just to get started, if my remote will work. Yeah, maybe, could you advance the slide? Yeah, I think this may be your slide. Yeah. Can, is that, can you plug this one in? I'll plug that one in, yeah. Okay. Oh. So, um, to get started, of course, we've been talking about the brain all day, and, um, but we haven't talked about that the brain really is a network of 100 billion neurons. So a human brain uh, consists of 100 billion neurons that are interconnected in, in circuits as shown here. So each of these neurons will connect with other neurons, and they can connect to about 10,000 other, other neurons. And so these connections are, are called synapses. And so uh, within the human brain, there are um, literally quadrillions of synapses. So hopefully right now, they're in your brains, uh, they're, you're, they're firing away like crazy, uh, um, and you have quadrillions of synapses. So now, if you blow this up and you look, here's one neuron, and it sends out a process and then uh, forms a connection with the next neuron. And if we blow this up, it's schematized here. Um, th this is the nerve terminal of this neuron here, and it's connecting with the second neuron. And th so the signal has to come down here and be transmitted and conveyed to this second neuron. And we know a lot about this process. An electrical signal comes down here, um, down the presynaptic nerve terminal and uh, releases chemicals, neurotransmitters, which then diffuse across the gap between the two cells. And those neurotransmitters then bind to receptor molecules here uh, that uh, convert the signal back into an electrical signal and transmit the signal. So this type of synaptic transmission is going on uh, quadrillions of times in, in your brain, and it's these connectivities that form the complex circuits, uh, the millions of circuits that give us the complexity to have emotions, to uh, uh, to think, make decisions, uh, to, to learn and remember. So I've, my research over the years has focused in on this synapse, uh, how do these synapses work at a very molecular and cellular level, and how are they modified? Now, of course, uh, synaptic transmission is not static. Um, you know, we learn from experience, um, we have to encode memories in our brain. So the synaptic connectivity of the circuits in our brain have to respond to our experiences and to our, our environment. So there's got to be some mechanism to, to uh, modify synaptic connections and modify synaptic strength in the brain. So many of you have heard about synaptic, synaptic plasticity, uh, but here's uh, what synaptic plasticity actually looks like. So uh, in this experiment, what we've done is we're recording from a, a slice of, of, of uh, the hippocampus from a mouse or rat. And the hippocampus, as many of you know, is really a, a critical region involved in learning and memory. Um, it's uh, famously known uh, the patient AHM who lost his hippocampus due to surgery uh, to cure his epilepsy. After his surgery, he had no uh, short-term memory. He could never learn anything new, and for 40 years, he would reintroduce himself to, to his doctors uh, every day. Um, so uh, we know this region of the brain is really critical uh, for learning. So this area of the brain has been studied uh, in detail to try to understand the mechanisms of learning and memory. And uh, what people were looking for um, back in the 70s and 80s 
where synapses that mo were modified, that the strength of synaptic connections could be uh, easily modified, and this modification could be, be long-lasting. So in this region, if you stimulate some neurons here, and then record from neurons here and measure the synaptic strength between these two, two regions, uh, you can measure the, the strength of synaptic uh, connectivity right here. So if you just stimulate and record, you can get a very stable response. So that's measuring the, the uh, synapse strength versus time. However, if you give a very high frequency electrical stimulation here, um, what they found is that you could uh, increase this, the strength of synaptic connectivity uh, and this would be, uh, last for a long time in, in the uh, slice, for several hours. Um, but in fact, in an intact animal, this increased synaptic strength uh, could last for a year. So this is exactly what uh, physiologists and neuroscientists were, were trying to, to, fi to uh, find and to understand, is that um, there's a way to modify synaptic strength in a very rapid way, uh, for example, during learning, and this could be uh, very, very long-lasting, lasting, lasting uh, for years. Now, um, of course, um, there are many forms of plasticity. Another uh, classical example is called long-term depression. And in this case, if you stimulate and record, you can get the same stable baseline. And in, um, if you give a low-frequency stimulation, uh, you can uh, promote a long-term depression uh, that decreases synaptic strength, and this uh, can be very long-lasting. So it's thought that these two types of plasticity are uh, what's involved in learning, that during learning uh, you induce these types of plasticity to um, strengthen some synaptic connections, weaken others, and this sculpts a circuit in the brain that actually encodes the memory. So when you stimulate that circuit, uh, you recall the memory. So for many years, uh, my laboratory and many, many other labs have been trying to understand what happens uh, during this, this event, what makes a synapse stronger, uh, or makes it weaker. Now, over the last 20 years, um, many labs across the country and the world, and uh, including my lab, have really figured out one of the, the primary mechanisms for how you modulate uh, the strength of a synapse. And so here is our, our synapse. We have a presynaptic nerve terminal that's releasing neurotransmitters. Here's the postsynaptic side that contains the receptors. And uh, what we found is that this, this form of plasticity, long-term potentiation, is actually a modification of the number of receptors at synapses. So when you induce um, plasticity, or in fact when you learn something um, and change the connectivity in the, in the brain, what happens is you actually recruit receptors and they're added uh, to the cell membrane and then added to the synapse. And so this makes this synapse stronger and, uh, and strengthens the connection and alters the circuits that encode the memory. Now in contrast, uh, with long-term depression, it's the exact opposite. What happens is when you um, induce long-term depression, the receptors are removed from the synapse and make the synapse weaker. Now, over the years, we've been studying this in great detail, uh, what are the mechanisms involved in this, and we've found um, a, a very large complex of proteins or genes that are associated and regulate this receptor movement to and from the synapse. So each of these, um, here we can see the, the receptors, and associated with them are individual proteins shown here. These are all encoded by individual genes, and they all regulate the, the way the receptor gets to the synapse and are, is removed uh, from the synapse. Now to note, um, many of these genes now are associated with, uh, with uh, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, and autism. Um, if you remember uh, from earlier talks today, uh, they were talking about the PSD complex. PSD95 is one of the genes that's found in mutated in schizophrenia. And so a lot of these genes that we've been studying for years in, involved in synaptic function and learning and memory are now uh, found to be uh, suspects uh, in uh, association with these uh, cognitive disorders. And I'll come back to this uh, at the end. So how do you study th this? Um, how do you study receptors? How do you study these molecules? And, um, you know, all neuroscientists uh, think uh, synapses are beautiful. Uh, this is a, a neuron grown in a, a, a dish. Um, so this is, it just shows the beauty of these, these cells, the cell body with these long uh, dendritic processes. And all these little green dots here are synapses. So you can see this neuron does have ten, thousands and thousands of synapses uh, on, uh, on, its, uh, on the cell. Now we're actually imaging, the green right here is receptors. 
So this is how we look at receptors. This is how we identify them, where they are, and, and, and follow them in time. Now this is actually uh, an antibody stain. Uh, so this is a, a static picture. But in, in uh, the last 10 years or so, we've been able to, to look at this in real time, uh, do live imaging of receptors as they uh, go in and out of the membrane. And one way we do this is we use, uh, this is mentioned earlier, we use a green fluorescent uh, protein or, uh, to, to, to tag the receptors. So we make the, the receptors themselves green, and then we can look at them in, as they move throughout the cell uh, and throughout the neuron. So in, in this case, we use a special variant of this green tag that's only green on the cell surface, as shown here, but it's not green inside. These are vesicles inside the cell where this is on the cell membrane. And so we can watch the dynamic movement of these receptors. If they're, they're taken into the cell, the f uh, green fluorescent goes away. And if you um, look at the insertion of receptors into the plasma membrane, uh, these uh, receptors become green again. So just to show you an example of this uh, is right here. So this is a neuron, again, it's, it's grown in a cell dish, and uh, it's using a special microscope. And we can see here are synapses, the little bright clusters along here. So the, the green, the signal here is coming from the receptors that are in the cell surface. Now we can use a trick where we bleach all the cells, uh, all the receptors on the surface. So this is what the cell looks like. We can't see the, the receptors inside because they're not green. But we can watch as the receptors are inserted into the, into the membrane. Remember, they, when they're inserted in the membrane, all of a sudden they become green. So you can see, uh, we can watch as the receptors are getting inserted into the plasma membrane, these little uh, vesicles uh, contain about 50 or 60 receptors. And this is how the receptors get to the cell surface and, and to the synapse. And of course, this is what's critical for regulating the density of receptors at the synapse and making a synapse stronger, and making a synapse weak. Now we can look at this in, in at individual events. So that's a 50 or 60 receptors being inserted into the cell membrane and then we can study how it moves throughout the membrane. So we've been studying this for many years and studying how you regulate uh, this receptor trafficking, um, but most of these studies are done in cell cultures, in, in neurons in the dish. Um, but um, very recently, in the last two years or so, um, uh, in unpublished work, we've been trying to do this in intact animals, in, in live animals. So what we do is we take this green fluorescent receptor, we get it, uh, incorporate it into, the, into a mouse uh, genome, and then we actually take a very fancy microscope, it's called a two-photon microscope, and actually put the mouse um, in the microscope. And then we uh, put the lens up against its brain, and we can actually image the receptors, just like we did here, inside in an attacked uh, live animal. Now, if you told me we were going to be doing this, this type of work even five years ago, I would have said you're crazy. Um, but it's really a, an amazing new technique. So here, um, what we're visualizing, these green receptors in live animals. So here, uh, this is a mouse. He's under a microscope. Um, he's uh, awake. And what we're doing is we're looking at the very top of the brain, very at the top of the cortex. And what I'm going to show you is a movie as we go through the brain, we're going to uh, focus the microscope into the brain, uh, about 500 microns. And the green will be the receptor molecules, and, and the red will be the structure of the neurons. We fill the, the neurons with a red dot. So you can see we're going down into the brain. We're following the processes of the dendrites as we go into the brain, and there are the cell bodies. And so we can see several hundred microns into the, into the brain. And then we can reconstruct this in three dimensions, as shown here. So this is in, in uh, the cortex of the brain. So you can see the three-dimensional reconstruction. Again, the green are the receptors. The, the uh, magenta is the uh, cell structure. This is the layer two, three cells of the cortex. And we can look at this, uh, zoom in, and look at the individual synapses. And I'll show you in a minute. Um, come back in time and watch as they change. So this is an unbelievable uh, new technique. So we're looking at synapses in an intact brain. And uh, what we can also do is go back. And uh, this is very stable. So we can actually uh, look at this over time. 
So here uh, we, we take a mouse and we image a certain region. This is a, a single uh, region of a neuron showing three different synapses uh, with different levels of receptors. We put the mouse back in the cage and then we come back four days later and we can find, remember there are, there are quadrillions of synapses in this brain, but we can come back uh, using tricks and find exactly the same synapse we imaged uh, three days earlier. And we can do this uh, for over a month. And you can see how stable these synapses are. Uh, the, actually, the level, even the level of receptors at individual synapses is, is stable. So we can really dynamically watch these uh, receptors during uh, very acute, uh, over hours, or even days or months, especially if we're interested in long-term uh, memory. Now, one thing we've been trying to do is actually watch learning happen. So what we're doing is we're actually has the mouse uh, under the microscope and we're teaching it a task. Um, uh, we're teaching it a little trick, a motor uh, reaching uh, trick, and we're imaging the part of the brain where we think that that, uh, that memory is encoded, and we're watching as um, the synapses to see if they get stronger as we would predict. And so here what we're doing is, is during the training, um, you can see uh, this is a, a part of, the, uh, of, of a neuron. Um, after about an hour of training, uh, two to three hours after training, uh, you start to see that the level of receptors, the green receptors in these synapses, is increasing with time. So we're actually watching these synapses become stronger and, um, and watching the learning process occur. So uh, this technique, um, now we can do this in, in many different uh, types of animals. For example, animals where we've not knocked out or mutated some of those genes we thought were involved in learning and memory. Or for example, in, in animal models for uh, schizophrenia, where we've made mutations corresponding to human mutations in the mouse, and we can watch and see how receptor uh, movement and, and uh, trafficking is in, impaired in those uh, mouse models of disease. So how do you study behavior in these mice? Um, so we want to learn, we study uh, a variety of forms of, of behavior. And this is a classic uh, water maze uh, behavior. Uh, so you can uh, uh, see how they learn spatial learning. And you put them in a, in a bath of water. Um, so it's a little bit milky. And right, you can barely see it here, but there's a little platform right under the water. And so you drop the mouse in, in this uh, bath. Mice generally don't like to uh, swim, don't like water, so they're swimming around. Sometimes you get mice that like to swim, so they sort of just sort of float, <laughs> float there. But uh, m the majority of them uh, don't like, and so eventually he'll find this uh, platform. Now, after a few days of training, uh, he knows exactly where it is, and, and we'll go there. So we can use this as an assay for, for uh, learning in, in these mice, it, and it's one aspect of learning we study. Now, more recently, we've been uh, interested in, in uh, anxiety and fear. And so we uh, began to, to study uh, fear learning and memory. And in this case, what we do um, is we take a, uh, a mouse and we put it into a, a cage. And we present a tone and at the same time give it a very mild shock. So it will become uh, to associate the tone uh, with the shock. Now, before you say, I'm. I'm um, uh, torturing mice, we do this to humans as well. So um, <laughs> we uh, present a tone and we measure their, their, their fear by measuring the amount they sweat. So it's, it's not a, a, a severe shock. And so an example is, is um, we take him out of this context, we train him in this context, and then we put him into a different context, so he's been presented with the tone and the shock. And so here, the testing, con he's in there, he's, he's moving around. And then we present the tone, and you'll see he sort of freezes. He's afraid. And then the tone goes off. And then he'll start moving around. So this is classic fear conditioning. Uh, it's done on, on animals and on mice and on humans. And this just shows the training. Uh, you, uh, you can train these mice uh, to be, respond to the tone very uh, quickly. And it's very long lasting. This, uh, if you present a tone a month later, uh, this mouse will freeze. So we've been studying how this sort of memory is encoded. Uh, but importantly, we became interested in how do you erase this uh, fear association? How can you uh, study 
um, uh, fear erasure. And uh, the classic way to do this is fear extinction. Many of you will probably hear about, about this. It's essentially a form of behavioral therapy uh, corresponding uh, to therapies that humans go through for, for uh, uh, trauma. Um, in this case, what we do is, is we, you present a tone, which will remind them of the initial shock. They'll freeze, but you present the tone 20 times in a row. Uh, they'll eventually dissociate the, the tone from, the, from the, the shock, and they'll no longer freeze. So this works, and about a day later, you come back and present the tone, and they don't freeze. But if you wait a couple days, or if you uh, remind them of the context that they were, had the uh, training in, uh, they have a relapse. And this is very common, of course, with behavioral therapy in humans as well, um, that uh, reminding a loud noise or something will remind the person of the trauma, and the, the fear will return. So we were very interested in this, and we studied this in great detail, uh, studying the receptors and what happens to the receptors uh, during this fear learning and, and during uh, behavioral uh, extinction. And this is a little bit technical, but um, it, uh, try to give you the big picture. We found that during the fear conditioning, during the fear learning, receptors were recruited to the synapses, making them stronger, just like we had find, found in other areas of the brain. Um, but about 24 hours later, a very strange thing happened, and that these receptors then exchanged for other um, receptors that we had been studied. Uh, it's um, not, the details are not uh, important, but there was a complete exchange over the next 24 hours uh, up to these other specialized types of receptors. And even weirder is that during the next week or so, uh, there, there was a complete exchange back to the other types of receptors. Now, this made no sense uh, at all because the synaptic strength was the same. Um, but I had a very good postdoc who realized that these, uh, in the 24-hour period, when these uh, sort of, uh, um, I'm colorblind, but they're sort of, I guess, magenta um, color um, receptors, um, are very unstable, that you can actually remove them th from the, the synapse and return um, and, and to the synapse back to its basal state, uh, basically reversing the potentiation that happened during the learning process. And so we learned how to engage this process, and we activate a form of LTD to remove the receptors, and this actually erased the fear association uh, of the memory. So, um, so this is um, a, a potential uh, therapy for, um, oh, can you get back to that? So, uh, so we uh, figured out this pathway that um, stimulating this uh, type of receptor, the mGluR type of receptors, this mGluR1 system, uh, can reverse this uh, fear association, but it only occurs within that window of opportunity, the, after 24 hours after the trauma um, and before seven days. So in theory, you would have to treat somebody um, very quickly, sort of like a stroke. You would have to treat them within um, uh, 24 hours or 48 hours. However, recently in unpublished work, what we found is that you can reopen that window uh, a week or even a month later by reminding them of the traumatic event. So if you present the tone a week or two later, and then 24 hours those receptors come back and the, and the, the synapse is un, unstable again. So in theory, um, this could be applied for PTSD sufferers. Uh, people come back from Iraq and realize they're having uh, uh, PTSD-like symptoms, um, we could reopen that window of vulnerability um, by using um, what actually the, uh, um, the military is using these days, uh, virtual reality uh, treatments where they, they um, reenact the, the trauma, the roadside bomb or, or whatever, uh, using virtual reality gaming techniques, and they use this in the psychiatry's uh, office. But we would want to do that, combine that, um, and wait 24 hours later, and then treat with uh, compounds to activate the signaling pathway. So, um, so we're working with a variety of chemists uh, to develop uh, po positive allosteric modulators of this pathway. And so the idea is to um, treat um, 24 hours after the trauma or 24 hours after reminding uh, a patient of the traumatic uh, event uh, with this activator, and this would reverse the uh, fear association with that memory. So it's only a, a sort of science fiction or a pipe dream now, um, but it's uh, 
something we're very actively working on. So finally, I just want to summarize that we've been studying how uh, receptors are regulated, um, both in learning and memory, um, but also in disease. And to reiterate that many of these proteins that we found um, are, uh, are mutated and associated with uh, autism, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, uh, but also other things like uh, Alzheimer's disease and um, as well as drug addiction. So um, this, of course, uh, none of us scientists do uh, this alone. I have a, a large laboratory who, of really fantastic postdocs and students um, who have done all this work. Roger Clem um, has done the work um, on fear conditioning. He's now actually in town in, at, up at Mount Sinai, having uh, his, his own independent laboratory. And of course, I want to uh, acknowledge funding, uh, BBRF for, uh, for the award, but also for a Distinguished Investigator Award back in 1999, which really drew me into uh, thinking about schizophrenia and, and uh, other cognitive disorders. Uh, Long-term funding from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, NINDS, NIMH, um, the Simons Foundation funds some of our autism work. And recently, I've been, uh, w f uh, uh, in response to the incredible genetics we heard about earlier today, uh, I'm following up on the genes that have been identified uh, to be associated with with uh, schizophrenia to try to understand how those genes work and how they may be involved in uh, schizophrenia from a grant from the Stanley Foundation. So I'd be happy to take any questions.